Welcome to Aging Insight with your host, John Ross and Lisa Schollmeyer. This program is made possible by Welcome to Aging Insight, everybody. I'm your host, John Ross, here with Lisa Schollmeyer, and we're on Aging Insight to bring you information that we know you need if you want to, I don't know, let's say, stay out of a nursing home, uh, if you want to avoid becoming a burden on friends and family and, and maintain your independence, and if you want to avoid losing your necessary life savings in the process. Those goals we see is, is almost universal among our clients yeah. and as people get older, and we know that it's possible. Unfortunately, the, the road navigating through all of that is complicated, and there's lots of little offshoots, and if you don't have a little bit of knowledge, you're going you're gonna to run into some problems out there. And, uh, and so we try to bring you this program as a way to give you that information so that maybe you can accomplish those goals on your own. Um, you know, we've talked about lots of different stuff in here, and, yes. and it all seems to kind of relate to these, you know, one or more of these three issues. Sure, right. Um, but one of them, you know, or I guess really kind of two of them, one of them is, you know, that maintaining your independence, um, and, and, and in the process, you know, not having to go through expensive legal processes right. uh, during that process. and and. We mention all of this because we've seen a couple of examples here recently of where people who actually thought they had planned everything pretty well um, had actually gone out and done some work and even maybe uh, had the advice of attorneys um, and yet, based on their circumstances, it turned out poorly for them. Yes, yeah, so we thought we might share with you some a couple of these cautionary tales today so that you can uh, observe from the sidelines of you know some of the things that other folks have found themselves in but also maybe you can take a little nugget or two from our stories today as you look to the future and plan for yourself so yeah well we're going to kind of start off with we there's a situation and 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 this is an actual case in in uh in a neighboring community to to our area but we had a gentleman who uh, have, he was professional, he uh, worked, and, but as he got older, he, he, uh, he ended up having a stroke. And as a result of having this stroke, he had a, uh, uh, a former spouse who he had appointed as a, a power of attorney who was handling all of his finances and, and by all accounts doing a, a perfectly acceptable job there. And he had ended up having to live in a assisted living place and it was right next door to his daughter, who, uh, who was also then kind of taking care of all of his personal needs and making sure that he had pajamas and making sure that his, his health care was being communicated and everything. And, and everything was rocking along just fine. You know, he, he had done powers of attorney. You know, we always talk about here that, you know, powers of attorney are very important. Sure. He had powers of attorney in place and he had a will that said who get, got his stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you how many people that, if they've done anything at all, um, then they have a will and they've got some powers of attorney. Right. Um, well, ends up that somebody files to become this person's guardian. Right. And they, they file a court action, even though nothing else is going on. And, and if, if I tell you that, and then I were to ask you the question of, who do you think filed for guardianship over this individual? Well, you know, John, you just said we had an ex-spouse who we had a good relationship with, mm -hmm. who had, he had signed powers of attorney over to at some point in time when he was competent and able to do so. So right. that's one candidate I would think that would sure. file for guardianship would be that agent under that power of attorney. But the other candidate, I guess, would be the daughter because she was looking out for his health care needs and, and everything. So was it one of them? It was his mechanic. Yeah, let that sink in for just a second. One thing a lot of people don't realize is that anybody, anybody, can file for guardianship over anybody else. And so the way the law is built, in, and if you think about it, we can kind of understand this. If we have a vulnerable 
senior out there who has lost the ability to care for themselves, um, that person may not have a spouse, they may not have any children, and we still need people to be able to step in and help manage the finances and help manage the, the personal needs and the health and all of that sort of stuff for that person. And so knowing that anybody might need to step up to the plate to help anybody else out, the law actually says that anybody can file for guardianship over anybody else. Now, the problem you get into though is, you know, maybe he had appointed uh, this ex-spouse as a power of attorney, clearly indicating that that's who he wanted to mm -hmm. handle his business. And yet, if a power of attorney gets appointed, I mean, if a guardian gets appointed, that power of attorney's gone. Right, a guardian always trumps the agent under your power of attorney. And so in this case, we had a car mechanic bring an application to the court asking to be appointed as this gentleman's guardian. And to our knowledge, there was no notice provided to the ex-spouse who was serving as the agent under the power of attorney. There was no initial notice provided to the daughter who was caring for her dad. Um, and so this car mechanic was in fact appointed as the guardian in almost an emergency style type hearing where uh, there was no record kept and there was simply an order entered along with a restraining order against the power of attorney agent and the daughter from uh, that prohibited them from accessing any of the money or assets that this gentleman uh, ha had accumulated up to that point. And, you know, John, I think that might be one of the key little pieces of information in this, uh, in this case, because the, these were not poor people. No, these folks had some, uh, had some assets there. And that's a lot of times that's where you start seeing these issues crop up. Well, listen, we're going to talk about how to, um, how you can do it, at least do your best to find your, to not find yourself in that same type of situation, but you're going to have to stick around until after the break for that. So uh, stick around. We'll be right back. Hi there. I'm Larry Sims. It's been my privilege for the past several years to be a volunteer board member of Hospice of Texarkana. And there I'm able to represent community members like you. We continually customize our end-of-life care to better meet the needs of our community. As an example, our medical director and nurse practitioner still make visits to homes and facilities. Call today to learn more about the help we can give your family. Hospice of Texarkana, the nonprofit hospice established in 1985 for the community, by the community. Welcome back to Aging Insight. I'm Lisa Schollmeyer here with John Ross. And today we are talking about, uh, you know, kind of a, a cautionary tale where we have a gentleman who had substantial assets, who experienced a stroke and ended up that his car mechanic who uh, got a guardianship over him. And, you know, John, the, the evidence in this case showed that the car mechanic, while they did have a business relationship of some sort over the years from you know, bringing you know, cars into repair, but they were not social friends, right. they were not hunting buddies, uh, they weren't any kind of connection other than that business relationship. Uh, but you know, in this case, we have uh, a car mechanic involved and then the court appointed a CPA to be the guardian of the estate. And 
we're talking upwards of three million plus. Right, there's as an quite estate. a bit of money in, in, involved in all of this. But you know, there was some argument in all of this that, uh, or at least some some indication that maybe that uh, that that uh, mechanic owed the gentleman some money. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was uh, the the CPA who was appointed to manage the estate. Um, uh, took fees for his services right. and 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 by by many accounts those fees were were very very high uh, depleting his assets uh, between all the legal costs and the attorney's fees and all of this uh, potentially up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. over a period of not that long right a year yeah um, and so the you know, when you get a court involved in your situation, um, it's a it's an extraordinarily expensive process, and unfortunately, it takes it completely out of the hands of the people that you intended and sticks it in the hands of a judge, right. who may or may not see the world through the same eyes that you see them, um, and and things you know it, it may sound a little strange coming from an outside standpoint to say well this guy this guy's ex-wife was handling his uh, finances that may sound strange from the outside but i've had many clients who have a prior spouse that yeah. while they 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 really couldn't uh, be married to the <laughs> right. individual they were more than happy uh, they, they still trusted the person and relied on them to help with with finances and things like that. Yeah. So that's actually not all that uncommon, at least not in, in my experience. Well, and just to clarify that, you know, if you've signed a power of attorney in favor of a spouse and that person becomes an ex-spouse after a uh, subsequent divorce, well then that power of attorney would be void, would not be effective. However, in this particular case, the gentleman signed a new power of attorney following his divorce from his spouse, which is effective. If, if after the divorce you still nominate someone and you indicate that by executing new documents in favor of that ex-spouse, then those should be effective and you are expressing your trust and confidence in that ex-spouse. You know, and John, in this case, they had children together. Um, so, you know, I kind of feel like maybe this gentleman was thinking, hey, I, I feel like my hey, ex-spouse is going to manage things for the benefit of our children. Um, no, it, it actually, once you think about it, 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 it makes perfectly good sense. Mm -hmm. Again, you, you can not be married to somebody and still have a lot of faith and confidence in their ability to, to do what's right, especially if you share children. Um, not in every case. No, no, that's a whole different episode. <laughs> but, but it seems to have been the case in this. And so we've got this situation where, and, and again, I, I can't be clear enough that anybody at any time can file for guardianship over anybody else uh, if they want to or they think they should be in control of uh, your person or your assets. Yeah. Now, you know, I've seen folks uh, who uh, maybe were in desperate physical situations, mm -hmm. um, abusive type situations, um, or, or maybe they're uh, just subject to being scammed because of their mm -hmm. uh, frailties. And, and, and people got involved to protect the person. Sure. But so often that is then tied to the money. Right, because you know, if you're gonna provide and make sure a person is, is in the right living conditions for what their needs are, getting their bills paid so that their you know, medical insurance premiums are being paid so they can see the doctor and have those co-pays covered through a you know, supplemental plan. You know, our person is tied a lot to the money in order to meet our needs as a person. So. Right, and so a lot of times, um, if, if there's some contentiousness going on out there, whether it's some random third party who's coming into the picture, like in the case that we're describing, or more commonly, at least as far as what we've seen, it's somebody in the bunch. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe there's several kids, but you know, one of them just doesn't get along with another. And, and there's some conflict between the two of them. One of them is the person you've appointed to handle all the business. The other one is just upset about that and is looking for a way to undo your decision making. Right, and you know, they go see a friendly attorney who tells them that a guardianship trumps 
a power of attorney and so off they go to the yeah. courthouse and again once you get into that courthouse um, it's very very difficult to get back out and you have no idea what the end result is and and i've explained this to countless clients that you can tell me the way you think it should be all day long mm -hmm. but that doesn't matter not in the least because ultimately the decision maker is the person wearing the black robe sitting up at the big desk in the front of the courtroom right. and they're going to decide what they think and that may be what you think it may not but again guardianship is an expensive process and so often when we see these contentious situations, it revolves around the money. It revolves around the money. So, um, you know, so the question would be, is there any way we can take the money out of the equation and, uh, you know, protect it, but stay out of the courthouse at the same time um, while making sure that that senior has control of their funds for as long as they're capable of having that control, but yet uh, trying to figure out a way that if that senior does suffer some diminished capacities and can no longer take care of themselves or their money, you know, is there a way to stay out of the courthouse and avoid the fight and avoid the expensive uh, nature of this fight and preserve the assets for that senior's needs? Yeah, so, and, and the thing is, there is. Um, there are some, there, you know, you, you can't prevent people from headed to the courthouse. Yeah, if you've no. got $287 and, a, and a, a ride to the courthouse, yeah. you can file Any anything, you want. anything you want at any time. But again, if you take the money out of the picture, that can, that can be the key to all of this. And, and whether it comes in the form of a guardianship or, or uh, with outside parties or families, there are ways to do it. We're gonna spend our last segment talking about that, uh, but you're gonna have to stick around until after this break. We'll be right back. Hi there, I'm Larry Sims. It's been my privilege for the past several years to be a volunteer board member of Hospice of Texarkana. And there I'm able to represent community members like you. We continually customize our end of life care to better meet the needs of our community. As an example, our medical director and nurse practitioner still make visits to homes and facilities. Call today to learn more about the help we can give your family. Hospice of Texarkana, the nonprofit hospice established in 1985 for the community by the community. Welcome back to Aging Insight. I'm John Ross here with Lisa Schollmeyer, and today we're talking about. Uh, we, we used an example of a situation where a, a complete third party um, decided that they ought to be the guardian over this individual in place of the person that, uh, the, the people that this, this gentleman had chosen um, mm -hmm. to be his power of attorney, to be his caregiver. Um, this third party steps in and, and tries to take over all of that. And whether it's a third party or whether it's a family member, we have seen this sort of thing mm -hmm. over and over and over. Um, and nine times out of 10, there's some sort nine of- Nine and a half times out of 10. <laughs> There's some sort of economic issue going on, yeah. it, um, whether it's just an outright money grab or... or uh, just control. Or just control yeah. of the finances or whatever. It uh, seems to, lots of times, it rolls around the finances. And mm -hmm. don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, you know what, uh, y'all are talking about some guy that had $3 million. I don't have $3 million, so that sort of thing could never happen to me. But, I, you know, I guarantee, that's right. <laughs> um, I guarantee you that you've got more than somebody else, maybe in your family or circle of acquaintances, and 
it, it you know the amount just doesn't matter um, you know yeah it, we've seen it over just things like a house yes. um, and and other assets like that you know that so often that may be the only asset you have mm -hmm. and yet that's a valuable asset sure. um, and so when we're talking about all of this again the whole idea is to take the if, if you can or if you need to is to take the the financial side of it out of the picture and the fastest easiest way to do that is by establishing a trust all a trust is is a stack of paper um, but once that uh, stack of paper is executed you have created its own legal entity. You've created this little vehicle out there, and this vehicle has a grantor, that's the person who created it. It has the beneficiary, that's the person that receives the benefit of it, and it has the trustee, the person who's in charge of it. But this is a separate legal entity out there. And so if, for example, they say, if, if I've created a trust, and I am the beneficiary of that trust, so it's for my benefit, and it says that if I ever become incapacitated, that I want my bank to handle all of the finances and make sure my bills are paid. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, you think I need to be under a guardianship and you head down to the court and apply for guardianship, even if you get that guardianship over me, the court has no power over that trust because that's, it's like two different people. Yes. And, and just because you get control of me, you don't get control of my trust. That's being managed by the bank and it's a separate entity. Right. So, you know, we do have a lot of folks that do use a trust as a management tool for their assets. Um, you know, we started the program talking about, you know, a lot of people that have done any planning, they do powers of attorney and they do a will. The problem comes in, if you're not dead yet, but yet you're incapacitated, we need someone managing your funds, your assets, and your health care and personal needs. Well, by using a trust, we've already separated out your assets and financial, uh, you know, uh, bank accounts and things into the trust, and we already have backup trustees named and listed that that asset, that trust asset, and anything that the tr that is held inside the trust is not governed by a guardianship should it be established at the courthouse. So, Yeah, so again, the whole idea is you take the money out of the picture. If you take the money out of the picture, um, that's going to resolve a bunch of these issues Most, because yes. so many of them are involved in the money. Now, notice in my example, I, I use the example of having a, a bank or some sort of corporate trustee manage that. Now you don't have to have a, a bank. So many people, when I mention the word trust, they say, oh, well, I don't wanna put everything in the hands of some bank. Um, they'll charge me a lot of money. They'll yeah, charge they me a lot you know. of money and everything. Well, first of all, let's talk about, for example, this doctor's case uh, that we were talking about that, that had uh, that where this guardianship came in. Had a bank managed a trust for him during his incapacity, uh, yes, the bank would have charged a fee it would have been a tenth of what the cost of all of those guardianship proceedings and that guardian CPA would have charging and all of that. Yeah. So we ought to be very clear that there is a cost either way you do it. Sure, and, and you know, one thing I think we haven't really made clear is while you're, if you set up a trust, while you're capable and competent, you actually serve as your own trustee. Right. You're so you're charge. the boss of your own money. You're not giving it away now to have someone else manage. You are the boss of your own monies. It's just, if there's that inkling of incapacity such that someone thinks a guardianship is appropriate, then if they go to the courthouse and establish that, then the only thing that happens with your assets is your named successor trustee steps up to manage those assets, but whoever applied for the guardianship does not get to have any say or management over those assets. Right, and so it doesn't have to be a third party like a bank, um, although in many cases, especially if you have a known situation where you have, say, two kids that don't get along, that fight about lots of things, uh, a lot of times it is a good idea to take it out mm -hmm. of their hands and put it in a complete third party. Mm -hmm. But like in this situation, um, 
you know, it probably still, it might have been okay to have uh, a family member or something involved just because, you know, who expected uh, the mechanic to come in? Right, you know, you know, this this gentleman could have appointed his, he could have created a trust and appointed his ex-spouse as the successor trustee, should mm -hmm. he ever become incapacitated. And at the point he had his stroke, she would have automatically stepped in and the car mechanic could have filed whatever he was going to file, but the court and the mechanic and the CPA and all could not have gotten to the assets. The ex-spouse would have continued to manage those for the benefit of the gentleman. That's right, and that trust would have governed and it would have protected those assets. And so those can be, those can be extremely valuable tools. And even when you don't have, um, you know, again, when I, often, so often when I say the word trust, people think of, uh, you know, John D. Rockefeller right. or, or something. Uh, and, and they're not, they're, these are not tools for the wealthy. They're tools for the people who, as we talk about on this program, want to maintain their independence, mm -hmm. that want to uh, um, avoid becoming a burden on others, and that want to protect and preserve those very necessary resources. Yeah. And, and of course, that's the whole reason you're watching this show. Um, and if you, if you didn't get enough information today, of course, you can always check us out every Saturday live at noon on 98.5, where we have Aging Insight Radio. Yes. Um, our website, uh, aginginsight.com, where you can watch uh, streams of this TV show, catch back episodes. Um, you can even listen to podcasts of the radio program, um, pick up a copy of our Aging Insight magazine. Yeah. I, there's just a bunch of places you can get some information out there. Well, and you know, even uh, reaching out on Facebook to Aging Insight, uh, you know, you can leave questions, comments, uh, whatever you like. Yeah, so we want to be that resource for you. We know that this information is important. We know that you're going to need it in order to navigate through this. Um, but there's so many resources available out there. There's just no reason why you won't have the information you need. So when you want to learn a little bit more, Stick around till next week. Catch another edition of Aging Insight. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this week's Aging Insight program with John Ross and Lisa Schollmeyer. This program is made possible by 